Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Iyad Murtada, and on behalf of the IMA Dubai chapter, I would like to welcome you all here today for our webinar for this month. Today, our webinar is going to be about a really interesting topic related to CV writing and interviewing tips. And today, we have here with us a very special guest. He volunteered to do this uh, webinar with us. And uh, today, our guest uh, is a Brand uh, Poisson. He is the head of HR at uh, uh, Amar here uh, in Hamptons, and at the same time, he is the UAE Charm Form leader. So, Mr. Brad, he's he's leader here in UAE in everything related to HR and and Charm activity. And today, he's going to be uh, discussing a really interesting topic about how can you write your CV in a way it will allow you to land your job, and at the same time, what kind of tips you need to have and you need to implement when you are you know, doing your interview. So before we start, you know, we have a question like, like all our webinars. If you would like to get the credit for the webinar, you need to answer the three questions that we are going to have during the, uh, the webinar. So this is the first question. I'm just going to open it right now. And we are going to have another two questions during the session. So the first question, when is the last time that you have updated your, your CV? And with that question, I'm just going to leave the, the mic to uh, Mr. Brad to start the presentation, please. Thanks, Yael. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a topic that's very important to me as someone who works in human resources. And uh, some of you may have been at a workshop that I presented at, I think, just over a year ago. So what I've tried to do is not repeat a lot of the information that was presented there, certainly do some summaries that were presented there, but get into some of the new information as well. Um, this topic I'm actually breaking up into two sessions. The first session today will be focusing on the CV side, and we will set up a second session, session B, uh, to focus specifically on interview tips. So again, today will be session A. Session B, we will set up at a later date. Um, so again, this is just a little bit about my background. Um, as Yael mentioned, I do a lot of work for SHRM, uh, generally referred to as SHRM. It is the largest human resource association in the world. And I would hope that a lot of you are familiar with SHRM. If not, uh, certainly we'll do our best to increase the profile of SHRM uh, so that it's an organization that you become more familiar with. So the format is, is follows two general categories. First, we just get through the key points, the essentials, things that you must do in terms of your CV. And I will leave as much time as necessary at the end to do my best to answer your questions, any questions that you have on the CV side. Again, we'll leave the interview section to another, another webinar that we do in the future. So today's topics will be broken into four groups. The basics for CV writing, the basics for cover letter writing, your online internet profile, as well as networking. I personally consider all of these as interrelated topics, uh, all things that you need to think about in the process of marketing yourself. Before we get into the CV, I wanted to emphasize some general strategic thoughts. And the first one is that Finding or changing jobs requires a customized strategy. Each one of you is unique. And make no mistake, the employer is looking for what makes you unique. You should not be waiting until you are out of a job to start to develop your job strategy. That is the second point, um, especially in a market like the UAE, where a lot of us are expats. And let's be honest about it, we do not have a lot of time to involve in the job search process. This is one of my favorite expressions. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who was the, the famous person, maybe some of you know who was the source of it, but the expression is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And one of the reasons why this is so important in terms of job search, CV, cover letter, is that I see so many people trying the same cycle of processes 
to get a job, to get the type of position that they're looking for. And I'm the first one to say to them, maybe there's something you need to change about your strategy. And yet people will consistently keep doing the same things over and over and then wonder why they haven't achieved a different result. And as I mentioned at the outset, getting a job is all about marketing. Most of you are accounting and finance professionals. I'm an HR professional, but make no mistake, when you're looking for a job, when you're looking at developing your career, we're all marketing professionals. Now, that's really, really important to, to remember. So as we can see here from the results, let me just open it for you. So it looks most of you updated your CV in the last year, which is really great. And like you know, Brad said, when you are trying to think about your CV, think about it. It's like a proposal you are sending to the person that he's hiring you, and you are asking him, you know, for the to get the position. So you should think uh, with your CV as a marketing tool, and you should really prepare it in a really nice way to get the job that you want. Yes, exactly. It is, it is the basics. It's usually not what will get you the job, but it is the foundation that has to be there. Uh, said another way, it's very unlikely you will be successful if your foundation is not in place. So I've got this slide here as a general reminder, and I mentioned this uh, last time when I spoke to the group. What is the purpose of a CV? Purpose of a CV is to get a job interview. What I see a lot of people doing is writing and working on their CV as if it will get them the job and they spend so much effort and time trying to make the perfect CV and it is the wrong place to be focusing your energies. So remember, the purpose of the CV is to get a job interview. The purpose of the job interview, that is where you try and get the job. Now I just want to make one last point before we move into my top 10 lists of CV tips, if you will. And that is, I'll be honest with you, I doubt the vast majority of you are going to do what I suggest you do in this webinar. That's up to you. We're all free individuals to choose what we do. But please keep in mind that I've been working in HR for 15 years. I have reviewed tens of thousands of CVs. I've interviewed thousands of people. So the tips that I'm giving to you are for your benefit. I'll be selfish too. I'll tell you, you know, part of the reason I do this type of workshop is that if people who are applying to the companies that I'm working for are better at applying for work, it makes my life easier. So it's a win-win type of situation. So what you do with the information that I give you today, that is completely up to you. I strongly encourage you to realize that everything that I'm telling you will help. It will help you and it will inadvertently help me. Top 10 CV writing tips. So in terms of number one, length. This is a very common question that I get is, is how long should a CV be? Uh, I would say honestly a maximum of two. There are very few people that have enough substantive information that requires three pages. And part of the reason we still refer to pages in a day and age of uh, IT and uh, job databases and people having their profiles online is that there's a very good chance that your CV at some point will be printed. And two pages is more than enough. Uh, three, uh, perhaps if the only time that I see CVs that deserve to get into three pages is maybe where someone is an academic background and they need to list their, their uh, publications, that type of information. So two pages maximum. The order of presentation in a CV, it should be chronological. There are many different ways to organize a CV, but when you're reviewing a CV, as I've done thousands of times before, you want to see the most recent information first. And that applies for every, all of the main categories or subcategories of a CV. In general, especially in this marketplace, you will often see a person's, uh, as they say, bio data or personal information first. Their name, their citizenship. In this market, we often do include things like age, 
uh, marital status. Again, in the UAE, that's fine. If you're applying for a position outside of the UAE, I would strongly encourage you that you do some research as to what are the norms in that marketplace. Because make no mistake, the CV in a market like the UAE is very, very different than in a place like the UK or in the United States. Quite frankly, a lot of the information that's put on a CV in this marketplace would be considered illegal in those markets. So it's really, it really comes back to my earlier point about customizing your personal marketing. You need to make sure that your CV is right for the market that you're applying in. So biodata is first. Experience and education, often those two sort of trade off as to which comes first or second. The general rule is that put whichever one of those is stronger for you. Whichever, if you're a recent graduate, there's a very good chance that your educational credentials are superior to your experience. In that case, it would make sense to put your education first and your experience second. But for the most part, once people get into their career, their experience is what the recruiter, what the HR, and what the hiring manager will want to see first. Next would be things like skills, followed by achievements and interests. And a point that I'll get into a bit later is that often what you'll find is that a reviewer of a CV, like myself, will actually start with the bottom information first, because we're already assuming that you have some level of minimum uh, qualifications related to your application. So we want to see what's different about you first, and that's usually found at the bottom of the CV. Graphics, in this day and age, with all the technology, uh, it's very uh, enticing to want to differentiate yourself through things like graphics and colors. In general, don't. You know, unless you're applying for a job where that kind of skill is part of the marketing, uh, just don't. You, one of the things that you often don't know is the technology resources of who you're sending it to, uh, the formatting, even there may be standardized programs, but sometimes formatting adjusts the layout of a, of a, of a CV. Keep it simple. People want to see the information first, not your creative flair. Emphasis. As I mentioned earlier, many experienced CV readers will actually read the CV from the bottom up. Uh, that's why it's so important to include things that differentiate you. Achievements, interests, but make them related to your professional goals. Uh, there are people who will put on their CV things like uh, interests, surfing the internet. Who doesn't do that? You know, it, it has to be something that is a unique element that you do that is also relevant to the work in some way, shape, or form. Great tips. So what do you think about, you know, putting a picture? You know, do you put your picture and at the same time, what other personal information you put, like your age, if you are married, you know, especially in the UA market, what, what is your feedback on that? Mine? Uh, it's a norm in this marketplace. Uh, I often explain to people that if I was working in the United States or in the UK, I would have to literally ignore over 90% of the CVs that come into my inbox because the information that's contained there, including something as simple as a picture, is potentially discriminatory. And in those markets, you need to avoid doing anything that's uh, potentially uh, a wrongdoing. So. Uh, it's, a, it's a norm in this marketplace, it's not illegal, uh, and because of that, uh, I think uh, it's something that people should do. It, it's just classic marketing, target marketing to the audience, uh, but do keep in mind, with, especially with technology these days, that uh, if you put your personal information, your CV information, into a broader forum online, uh, I would limit a lot of that personal information, marital status, age. Um, the majority of the developed world, those things are not paid close attention to, and as I mentioned earlier, could be deemed uh, discriminatory. Font. Uh, my general recommendation is not to do anything smaller than 11-point uh, font. Uh, 
Uh, I see people, especially people who are technically orientated, and by that I do mean people in finance and accounting, IT, there's a real tendency to want to put as much information as possible on the page. And I can see why that would be the case, but wherever possible, avoid that. Uh, if you did programming languages five, ten years ago that are something that you're not doing today, that's not relevant to the job that you're doing, don't include it. Uh, or put programming language experience. Um, again, I can usually look at a CV uh, and tell you without reading any of it that it's coming from an IT person or a finance person because there's a certain way people in those fields try and really put a lot of information on the page. They Usually as a result, you will use a smaller font and it's, it's a disadvantage in terms of the process of the CV. SEO, search engine optimization, if uh, you're not aware of that sort of abbreviation, it is, and it relates a bit to the earlier point, really important for you to use uh, keywords that do come up in search engines that represent elements that differentiate you uh, from other people. Uh, an example could be your academic cr credential, your professional credential. Many times when uh, I've recruited for positions in finance, uh, our finance team would say to us, well, we need someone who's worked with, for example, Oracle before or PeopleSoft. So do make sure you include those elements that are uh, your strong points in terms of generally skills, but it could be professional qualifications or edu education as well. References, I would say about 10 years ago, it was more common that almost all CVs would have references. Some people like to include references because they feel that the people that they're referencing are quite notable and it, it's kind of like having someone of substance uh, marketing for you. But in general, don't include it in a CV. Uh, it's not something that uh, recruiters or HR people look at at first and quite frankly, they're looking at potentially hiring you, not your references. If and when the time comes up that they need to check references, they will ask you. Besides, it also gives you more space to put other elements uh, related to yourself in terms of marketing. Double check your spelling. It goes without saying that, that spelling, grammar for all of these presentations of yourself are important. You will find in markets like the UAE that people are, are generally quite forgiving because for the large percent of people, English is a second language, but at the same time, you have as much time as you need to make as perfect a presentation of yourself on a CV as you have. So there's very little excuse for, I'll call, laziness in terms of your presentation. Some recruiters will actually exclude people who have spelling or grammar mistakes in their presentation. I don't fall into that category, but you're, if you're applying for jobs, you never know who's on the other side of receiving that. And even if it gets through the first screening, Maybe the next screener has a very strong feeling on this. It's better to be safe. Make sure you do your best to check the spelling and grammar and ensure that it's uh, as accurate as possible. Last but not least, in terms of pointers for CV, be truthful. I mean, it goes without saying, but at the same time, especially in this day and age of technology, where there's almost a paper trail of our histories online, if not with our former employers, anytime you start to exaggerate the truth, you're entering a danger zone. And uh, for lack of a better word, lying or being uh, putting false information in your job application is generally a good enough reason for an employer to end your employment. Uh, so be truthful. It's only to your benefit. Uh, especially if you get into a role and the expectations were based on something that you stated and you don't have that skill set, you don't have that competence, no one wins in those circumstances. Next I'm going to talk about cover letters. Cover letters used to be extremely common in the application for job process and in fact um, it 
it's not something that is as common as it used to be. But by and large today, when people are applying for work, it's sent electronically. And in that electronic format, if it's an attachment, or even if you've cut and paste your CV into an email, there is an opportunity to introduce yourself. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about cover letter, your introductory information that comes before your CV. This is so crucial. I would dare say my personal experience is that it's more crucial than the CV itself. Why? Because most people do nothing in this area. They simply send you their CV with no introduction. Let's talk about some tips as it relates to writing cover letter information. One or two paragraphs, maximum. You know, worst is no information. At the other extreme are people who will have five, six paragraphs of information. And as the recruiter, as the screener, you realize that none of that information has been written for you. It is simply a generic uh, blurb on a page where things are cut and paste, your name, your company, something about your organization. It's almost better to include nothing than have too much information in the cover letter. But do put something. In particular, greetings. 95% of the CVs that I receive, either in a general email box or directly to myself, have absolutely no personal greeting to me. It's dear sir or madam, or it's nothing at all. I guarantee you that if you want to get attention, and all you do is find out the person that you're sending it to and address the email to them, even if it's just to a career inbox, if you find out who's the head of HR or who's the head of recruiting, don't worry about being wrong because right away you're connecting with the person on the other side. It makes so much difference. I will, in fact, if I see a, a package of CV and introductory information that is sent without a greeting and then in the two line it's addressed to 12, 20, 50 different companies at the same time, I don't even look beyond that. I delete that information. Because if someone is just spamming for a job, I don't want them to come into my organization. I want someone who knows exactly what they want, what they're looking for, and they've done their research, and they want to work with the organization that I belong to. Content. Do your research. Something in the cover information should be specific to that organization. So it shouldn't just be a general, generic, cut and paste uh, covering information that could be sent to anyone. It should have something, some content that specifically refers to that business, that organization, what it does, and how you can add value to that organization. You can't fake customization. Tone. Relates directly to the previous point. You cannot fake addressing uh, a customized cover letter and even customize elements in your CV to an organization. Um, dear sir or madam is the exact opposite of customization. So when you have the person's name, the recruiter's name, the head of HR, or even the hiring manager information, then use that and right away you're telling whoever's reading this that this is specifically directed to them, and it makes a big, big difference. Uh, universal value proposition, UVP. Outline in what's unique about you. Hopefully your CV says what's unique about you as well. But now is the time, before someone sees your CV, to grab their attention. It comes back to my earlier point about marketing. This is marketing. And if something doesn't grab your attention quickly, you move very quickly onto the next information. My next slide lists three resources that I've used personally, and I can't recommend them enough. The first one is a link to a website. The website is called asktheheadhunter.com. And this is actually a fairly old website by internet standards, and the presentation will 
feel that way. But the advice that this, this gentleman whose website this is, he's been doing headhunting in the United States, specifically in Silicon Valley, for I believe it would be 25 years. And his advice is almost the exact opposite that you get from the majority of resources that are out there. And why is it the exact opposite? Because it works, because we're differentiating, we're doing things differently than everyone else is doing. And he's telling you as the headhunter, as the person who's on the other side of the table, the best way to be different. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be who you are, but I really encourage all of you, if you have the chance, to go to that website, look up specifically the basics element, the basics of getting a job, and listen to what he says about doing things differently. The second recommendation I have is a book. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you have may, may have read it. It's called The Startup of You by a gentleman named Reed Hoffman. Uh, if you're not familiar with his name, you're probably familiar with his company. He is the gentleman who started LinkedIn. And his compilation of this book is a direct result of his experience of setting up LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is a networking site. Uh, in many ways, the backbone is designed to be much like your uh, Rolodex in sort of the old terminology your stack of business cards, your network of relationships. And I can't tell you enough how unique this uh, perspective is. And reading the book is invaluable in terms of thinking differently about yourself, how you fit into the job market, and what you can do to take control of that. A lot of the information in the next few slides that I'm going to talk to you about are directly sourced from that book. The second book that I recommend is called The Rare Find, and that is a slightly different book, although it's about recruiting as well. Uh, what this gentleman did was he looked at uh, actual case studies in the marketplace as to what was really differentiating success from failure from the point of view of recruiting and selection. And he found that a lot of the stereotypes, a lot of the things that we believe, like a person should go to a an excellent school and have a perfect education and the ideal professional credentials do not translate into job success. And so a lot of the examples that are he uses in the book, again, sort of in a case study format, show where recruiters have learned that their system of recruiting uh, needed to be reconfigured in order to get the best candidate. So I recommend all three of these resources to you. They're resources that I've personally used. And again, I have to give a lot of the credit to the things that I'm talking about as having been co-sourced from these, my personal experience, as well as resources like this. OK, great uh, recommendation. Now, we can see that most of you, based on the question, that about 70 of you are looking currently for a job, which is great. You are going to benefit so much from this presentation. Now, one of the questions that I have, what do you think here in the UAE market, you know, the HR managers, what kind of information are they looking for? And at the same time, what kind of information they are searching over the internet related to, you know, the candidates that they are interviewing? It's a very good question. I think the general reference that you'll hear a lot is fit. Um, one thing that's very hard for candidates to know is the culture of the organization that they're applying for. And you may be the perfectly skilled person for the job that you're applying for, but the reality is, is your personality, your work ethic may not be a good fit for the organization. You may actually be more qualified. You may be overqualified. Your work ethic may be stronger than the organization that you're applying for. That is sort of the responsibility of the recruiter or the HR to make that type of decision. And that's also why I say the best thing you can do is be yourself. Uh, if it's going to be a successful fit, if you misrepresent yourself, if you try to be someone you're not, um, you're sending mixed messages to the organization. So the HR is looking for fit, the recruiter is looking for fit, and that is a very uh, subtle, soft skill that is very hard to tell when you're the applicant. Uh, a good recruiter, a good HR person will be looking to complement their team 
In other words, that before they even start the recruitment process, instead of just looking for a job to fill, they will also sort of ask themselves questions like, what's missing on our team? What do we need that we don't have? And often in a market like the UAE, that could be something as simple as language skills. There's so many diverse nationalities in the UAE. Your organization may have uh, English speakers, Arabic speakers, but maybe a large part of what you do targets the Russian market. So you need someone who speaks Russian. Again, you may be the best accountant and finance person in the world, but what you don't realize is perhaps that the organization is looking for a finance person and speaking Russian is equally, if not more important to them. So it's that customization of fit that's uh, uh, a good HR person and recruiter will look for. The next section that I want to talk about is your online profile. Um, I guess what I'd say to all of you is that in the past year in particular, although I was doing it previously, is that once I've got my short list of people, as they say, on paper, so if I've reviewed 200 CVs and I've got maybe 20 CVs in a short list, the very next thing that I do is I go online and research people. And make no mistake, recruiters are doing this now, everywhere. If they're not doing it, it's, it, why would you not do it? It will become the norm. So my question to you, to all of you, is what is your online profile? Google yourself. See what is online about you. Does it represent you the way you want to be represented? Does it help or hurt your professional goals? These are all things to think about. Is there even anything on the internet about you? You know, maybe you've got a Facebook account, but it's, uh, the privacy settings are such that it's completely private. Uh, I would say to you, when I, as a recruiter now, go through uh, online search for someone, if I don't find anything about someone, it actually worries me. It actually concern. I'm saying, where is this person in this day and age of technology? Said another way, usually what happens is those people who have nothing about themselves online in any way, shape, or form go into the B pile or the C pile. In other words, uh, they don't become my short, short list at that time. So it's very important that you think about this. And I think as a recommendation that all of you should think about getting information about yourself online that represents you in a way that you want to be represented. As I say here on the slide, create and manage your online profile because if you don't, the internet will do it for you. And the place to start, in my honest opinion, is LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has been around as a software uh, program for quite a few years now, but I think it's only been in the past year that it's really starting to be used by recruiters, HR people, in, a, in an exponentially growing way. And I think a lot of it has to do with link, what is LinkedIn is doing in terms of things like posting jobs, uh, and I think they will get even better with their ability. They're, what's happening right now, I see as a recruiter, is there sort of a convergence between the standard database, like a monster golf or uh, golf talent, these types of just typical dead databases where you keyword search for skills. What LinkedIn is doing is taking that, but they're combining it with references. In other words, your personal network. And they're able to put the two together. And that is really empowering recruiters to use a more subjective and personalized way of finding good people. So your LinkedIn online profile. Originally this webinar started with CVs, but make no mistake, your online LinkedIn profile is the modern version of a CV. Um, you'll, if you have a LinkedIn profile, Usually the first element of that is, is something in the area of an objective line. 
the recommendation from the author as well as myself is to market say something that markets yourself within your network so it's not sort of a career goal line uh, you know where you say a, a, a finance manager with five years of experience in consumer goods think about a way to write that line that differentiates you from your network so you're not really don't write it in a way that's applying for a job but if the only people that were to look at it were all of your peers in finance and accounting what can you write to that audience that stands out and says something unique about you that's the type of information that should be included in that objective line next you'll notice on LinkedIn there's an element relating to references um, here is a logical, uh, rational place to include references. And I guess the point that the author would make and that I would also reinforce is make sure that these are professional references. This is LinkedIn, it's not Facebook. And the agendas are very, very different from a social network to a professional business uh, network. And I would encourage you to use references in a qualitative sense. Have people that you trust, that are reputable, say something about you that adds depth to your complete presentation. I don't know if this is really obvious, but connect to people that you actually know. Uh, LinkedIn is not a popularity contest. I would rather have only 10 people in my network of LinkedIn contacts who were highly influential, had significant power and influence in the market, than have a thousand that I didn't know that had no way, shape, or form the ability to help me. One of the points that the author makes in his book, The Startup of You, is that if you have a network of LinkedIn connections and they are unable to help you when you need help, then you really don't have a link, you don't have a network of connections. Um, it, it wastes the tool that is this type of software. So first point, connect to people that you actually know. The second point would be to connect to people who are working directly in the organization or your professional field. So maybe some of these people you don't know, but they become people that would fit within the immediate circle of people that you should know. Said another way, there's a very good chance that even if you don't know that person, that the two of you will have someone that both of you know. It's about it, building a network of quality, not quantity. And as I mentioned to earlier, LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, I have a general personal rule that I tend not to have any crossover between my connections on Facebook and my connections on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is business. For me, that's HR. Uh, Facebook is what it is. It's social. It's all of my friends, my family, my people that I've met over the years. There are few exceptions to that. But by and large, I would say that the, the two, if you will, databases are 95% different. Networking. What we're talking about is networking. It's online. It's in person. Um, all of the things that I've described so far are sort of the basics of writing a CV and now thinking about writing a CV online, your professional personal profile. All of that said, there is no substitute for having a strong network of professional colleagues. Uh, the author of The Startup of You, the way he puts this is, your network is your job security. That's really important to think about. When you think about how the market changes, when you think about how the market today is different than it was five years ago, you know, companies that we talk about, like a Facebook, uh, who, who out there doesn't know the story about Instagram, a company that's not even two years old 
and they compare that to a company in the United States like Kodak, which I believe is 150 years old. Part of my point is, is that the market five years from now will be very, very different than it is today, including the organizations that are out there. The constant will be your network. That is your primary resource for job security. So there is no substitute for having a strong network of professional colleagues. Technology, it makes connecting with people easier. But real and valuable personal connections are actually become harder. Uh, and that is where the value is. So you should do both. But make no mistake, the people that will be of most value to you are people that you've built a personal connection with not an online connection with. Make it a habit to go to as many industry or similar trade shows, events as you can to build your real network. Uh, one of the ways I describe that, it's like going to a library and you don't always, you have, you know what you like, the types of books that you like to read, but part of what most people do when they go to a library is they start to browse, they start to look around and maybe they find a book or a section of books or just general information that they really didn't know about and they start to be curious and get absorbed. Networking works exactly the same way. Just being at an event, maybe you're not even there for the substance of the event, but maybe you end up meeting someone who becomes an invaluable contact to your future. So please don't ignore the importance of in-person networking. People connect with real people. Uh, online profiles uh, are like business cards. These are necessary now. These are expected now. But a business card is just a starting point. Networking. I call this the 50% rule. It's not empirically validated, but in my personal experience, uh, this is true. When I look at my jobs that I've held over the past 15 years, half of them have been through applying for a job, half of them have been through my network. That's what I mean when I say the 50% rule. All of these things that we're discussing are the basics that have to be done, but you will find that the best job opportunities for you will usually come through your network, at least half of the time. And if I would suspect the vast majority of people listening to this would have had a similar experience. If it's not 50-50, maybe it's 60-40. The point is, is if you are looking for a job, why would you ignore either 60% or 40% of your market, your market of connections, your market of potential? One of the advantages that direct networking has in terms of jobs, and if you think about it, and again, it relates to my own personal career, is that referrals, if you're looking to be promoted, if you're looking to take on more responsibility, chances are if you're applying for a job online or in a typical uh, fashion, at best you're going to have a horizontal move, meaning you're moving into basically the same type of job that you already have. Referrals is usually where people get the next step up. If you don't get the step up within your organization through its own promotion uh, channels, it is very, very unlikely that you, when you apply for a job, if you're applying as a supervisor and you want a manager's job, that you will get it. It just, it just on balance, doesn't happen. As I alluded to a bit earlier, all of these are basics and important. They're expected. So. I would suggest don't feel like that some of these new techniques and new uh, methods are substitutes for the basics. They're complements. You really do need to have the basics in place. It's like building a pyramid. You have to have that foundation first before you can go to the middle and the top level of some of the more new techniques that we're talking about in the second half of this presentation. Just a few summary points. Career planning and job hunting, these aren't separate activities anymore. It used to be that you would think about your career, uh, how, what kind of education you had, what kind of professional development you had, and job hunting as separate. These two are intimately related.
point from the book, again, the startup of you. Uh, the author talks about what he says, A, B, Z planning. What that means is that A is your current job. A is what you're doing now. B is the next job that you want. You need to know what that is. And Z is like your backup plan. If things don't go as well as intended, what is your support structure? What is your plan Z? What is your emergency plan? When you're planning your career, you should have all three of these thought out and organized. Your current position, where you're going next, and your backup plan. Treat your career as an ongoing work in progress. Again, from the book, The Startup of You, the author refers to it as being in permanent beta. For those of you with a technology background, you'll realize that what that means is that it's sort of the uh, testing process of software before it gets officially launched as a finished product. Uh, I don't know very many software today that don't have bugs in it that can be considered 100% reliable and perfect the way the designers and way the owners of the software companies want. At some point you just have to put it out there. It's a constant process of refinement and improvement. And that's exactly the way you should be looking at your career. It used to be in the old days that you would get an MBA, you would get a CMA, and it was sort of like crossing one finish line. And you would go to the next level and you would stay in that level until you maybe had another goal. Maybe the next goal was to go from a manager to being a director. And once you cross that line, you're on the other side of that finish line. world doesn't work that way anymore. You may go through that cycle within an organization, but that organization may go through financial difficulty and be bankrupt. So you've done everything right. It's the organization that hasn't been organized and planned as well as it should be. The best way for you to counterbalance that is to think of yourself as an ongoing work in progress. And I guess this is my last point, is, is you have to believe in yourself. You know, when it comes down to all of these steps, if you don't believe that you have something to offer an organization, they're not going to believe it. And people feel that. People feel confidence. They feel what you feel. Uh, there's many different ways this similar idea is expressed. You know, you attract the energy that you give off. So again, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. In terms of marketing yourself, you need to believe that you have something to offer. And as an HR person, I would say to anyone, everyone has something to offer. It's about fit after that point. Finding the right person for the right opportunity uh, in the marketplace. So. With that, that's the end of session one. I want to open it up now for any questions that anyone may have. If there's any questions relating to interviews, again, we'll do another webinar at a later time, uh, but specifically related to CV writing, cover letter writing, uh, your online profile, and networking. What a great presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Brad, for this uh, amazing presentation. Now, like you said, you know, there's currently there's no way to success. Success is the way. And when you are trying to market yourself, you know, don't focus on your skills. Don't go there saying, look, I'm so good in accounting. I'm so good in finance. I did this and that. Because what you need to really market is yourself. So it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. It's about what can you be doing in the organization differently than the other candidates. So always think in, in that when you are you know, trying to apply for a job and writing your CV. And you can write, you know, your question in the chat box. We are going to get your question. But one of the questions that I have for you. So you write your CV, you write your cover letter, and, you know, you go to do the interview. Yeah. Do, you, do you bring them with you? Do you know, do you present them? What, what do you do during the interview with your CV and cover letter? Well, I definitely recommend that you bring it. Uh, it's, it's like a backup. Even today for this presentation, you know, I've got my printout here. In case for some reason something didn't happen, I would know what my, it's, it's about being prepared. So that's the main reason that you bring it to the interview is to show that you're, you're prepared and it, it's like an insurance plan. I, I don't, usually what happens for me is I, for the interview I will have a printout of the CV 
and I will have made notes on the CV itself. So it becomes a new document. So what you give me isn't really of much use. Uh, I've sort of taken your document and I'm making notes on it. So it's, it's become a different document. Thank you very much. We have one of the questions. What if you don't know the person that you are trying to address the cover letter to? What would you do? Would you like uh, say something to your sir or what, what would you do? Well, I guess I'd start by saying that in this day and age, you can usually, again, using your search skills online, start with the organization's own web page. At least 50% of organizations will have a list of the management there. Uh, and included in that would obviously be the head of HR or perhaps even the hiring manager. Uh, a second tool that you can use is just a general Google search. If you've got the organization's name, you can type in things like the organization and then write the words head of HR or HR manager. Um, don't worry about getting it wrong. So, you know, if I even, if I get something sent to me that's addressed to my boss, the managing director, or my su the supervisor, someone who works under me, the point is, is you've got my attention where nine out of 10 people didn't get my attention and you're showing an effort, an effort that nine out of 10 people didn't show. It's always going to be well received. We have another question here. What about the recommendation letter? Do you think they should you know, send a recommendation letter with the CV and the cover letter when they send the email? In general, no. It's, it's um, for several reasons. I think a lot of experienced recruiters like myself realize in this day and age that a lot of that information is, is, can also be, um, uh, you know, with different technologies, it might not necessarily be true. Uh, if a, if a recruiter is going to get uh, reference information about you, they're going to go directly to the person. The letters are nice, they can't hurt you, but at best they break even. An organization will contact people directly to get re referral information about you. They just won't trust something that's on paper. That doesn't mean it's not true, it doesn't mean that it doesn't say something that's useful, but the amount of weight you put to it is very, very small. Okay, at the same time, many of you know, the companies here in UAE, what they are doing, they are not just accepting CV and cover letter, mm -hmm. they are asking you to fill up a form on their website and they are right. asking you many questions. Yes. And some of these questions related to, what do you think you are the most suitable for this job? So yeah. what can they you know, answer for, for that question? That, that should be something that you think about already too. We'll get into it a bit more when we talk, have the interviewing webinar, but that is, there's, really only about five or six questions that are core in an interview that give first inf interview information. Answering that question is one. You need to, there are other people who will be applying for the exact same position as you. What is different about you? One of the questions I ask in interviews to people is just that. I say, I'm going to be interviewing other people. What is different about you from those other people that I will interview? And you need to think about that so that you have an answer. It's not something that I can answer in sort of a webinar. Uh, it's just something that, because it should be specific to you. There's no generic answer to that. If you give a generic answer, uh, you know, I've got a business education, I've got five years experience in finance, and I work with Oracle. Who doesn't? You know, of all the shortlist people, they will all have that. So you really need to think about what is really different about you from the others that have exactly the same core set of experiences and skills that you do. Now, one of the other questions that we have related to the CV, you know, when they are writing their career objective, yeah. what kind of information or how they should, you know, think about writing that? Well, it's, it's a mixed answer. And I guess one thing I'd... I'd preface by saying is that a lot of the information that I'm giving you today is based on a lot of years of experience, but there are other recruiters and HR managers that will have a different opinion, so realize that. And part of the reason I bring that up is because some managers, recruiters right now are saying don't even include an objective uh, line. Uh, you've sent your information to our organization. We're assuming you want a job with us, so it's understood. Uh, I do believe, a lot like the, if you will, the LinkedIn profile, that it's important to sort of use that initial introduction to say something about yourself. Uh, it could be the perfect, especially if you know that there's a, an, an exact job that you're applying for. Um, that's a perfect time to say in that objective line, uh, uh, an experienced finance professional with 
eight years experience looking for a position of uh, uh, assistant controller that involves international coverage as well as supervisory responsibilities. I have nothing wrong with that, especially if that is the job that's open. And it shows, again, you're customizing your marketing presentation of yourself to that specific position. Great. Thank you very much. I think we have time for other, uh, other, uh, another two questions. So one of the questions is, could you uh, give us like, you know, a brief introduction related to the career pro profile as substitute to the uh, cover letter? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, the cover letter and the CV should not repeat anything. That's probably the best way to think of it, is if you're just simply restating in a paragraph or two what's in point form on your CV, you're, you're wasting uh, effort. What should be in the initial introduction, that is a cover letter, is that personal narrative that talks about, again, how you're different and what you can do to add unique value to the organization. That should not be directly included in your CV. Your CV should be like a, a photograph, a snapshot, an objective picture of who you are, your background. It should not be subjective. It should not be written in a narrative. Um, for the most part, people know that, but try your best not to repeat anything that's in your CV because it's already there. This is the opportunity where if you didn't have the chance to meet in person and you needed, you know, it's almost like an elevator pitch, as they say. If you had one minute to introduce yourself to the person, what would you say in person? Put that in writing. Thank you very much. I think for the last question, I'm just going to ask it. Uh, what do you think about the video CV? You know, so many tools are coming where people are doing like for sure about themselves or they are doing video CV and they are sending it to the recruiter. What, what is your feedback on that? Good question. Um, Marketing is a lot like education. More is usually better. But this is what I'm about to say next is really important to keep in mind. Uh, I spend about when I'm going through a mass screening of my inbox for careers and jobs, I will spend between three and maybe 10 seconds looking at a CV. Uh, I don't have time to look at a video CV until I'm in that position of a short, short list. Not even a short list, a short, short list. So it, especially if you're in the, uh, a type of work where you uh, media is your job, is your experience, then I think it's extremely valuable. Uh, but Again, flipping it around from the point of view of cost-benefit for the recruiter, they don't have time to look at that until you've made the short list. And if you don't do the things right to get to the short, short list, they'll never look at it. So it's a, it's a double-edged question. If it's the type of work that you're trying to get a job for, then by all means, that's your portfolio. You should do that. But if it's not, if it's just simply a complement to your other presentation, uh, do it. But it's something you do at the back end and realize that it may be something that you can point someone to once you've made a short, short list. It will not be something that gets you an initial screening. Well, thank you very much for uh, this presentation, Brad. Uh, thank you uh, for attending here today. And on behalf of the IMA Dubai chapter, I would like to invite you to attend our future webinars. Usually we are doing a webinar every month related to different topics that will add value to you. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. My pleasure.